Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We were talking about rural Europe and the transformations that happened in rural Europe and led it to the status in which it was or found itself in the dark ages. This practice of having farm labor bound to the estate as we saw originates during the troubled times of the Roman Empire. But it becomes rooted and becomes the predominant socio economic and political system of rural Europe for a long, long time, for more than 2000 years. The system which it eventually led to and which found itself manifesting itself in different forms across Europe is a system called feudalism. Can somebody tell me something about feudalism? Krishna? Right. 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 Excellent. What feudalism did was that it created a political order, a political hierarchy through which rural society was organized. We have already seen that it was a pyramidal structure. We have already seen also it was a system, it was a system based on the principle of fief. Does somebody remember fief? Fiefdom. I remember writing something on the blackboard about this sometime. So, what is fiefdom? Discussing hierarchy and. Uh, mm, okay, hierarchy in a sense, but fief uh, is a dual reciprocal obligation between members of people at two levels in the hierarchy of feudal society. If you recall it, we found that the, at the top echelons of society, you had the fief relationship between the local lord and the king emperor and the local lord himself had his vassals with whom he had a fief relationship. By and large part of the fief relationship was security, part of it was economic. If you recall once again, you will remember that Military obligation was an important part of fiefdom. You had to serve your lord not just through your own arms, but by providing a certain number of armed men, equipment and resources to support any, any venture which your lord might be interested in taking up. So, one is military service, armed service. The other is economic. You pay a certain fee honoring the superior rights of your lord over you. Now, this fee varied across Europe and across times. At times, it was quite exacting, quite exacting actually. 
and at times it was almost a token like a fistful of grain and no more. But what was important was the reciprocal obligations. If you need protection, the Lord gives you the protection, but in order that the Lord might give you protection, you serve the Lord militarily. We have seen how across the world this feudal system from Japan into Europe had different forms, it was not the same. Part of this whole fabric of society as we have seen again earlier is the ideology of feudalism, the code of honor which bound different members of the hierarchy to each other and finally we have also seen how the whole structure was religiously reinforced and supported by the active involvement of the church. The church itself was among the largest landholders in Europe. So, was actively participating in the feudal economy and feudal society. We have seen all these things. What is important is that this combination of things led Europe into a great stagnation that at dark ages was a period of also economic stagnation. redoubled as Burton Russell says with the stagnation of a society which rests entirely in the faith, no inquiry, no speculation. The crusades have a huge impact on the feudal society. For one thing, the status of the rural political leadership, the aristocrats is to be constantly displayed through conspicuous consumption. For another, now they have to make their contribution to the crusades in kind and in manpower. So, the crusades turn out to be a huge burden on rural Europe. Each time the crusade moves out, it is a huge burden on rural Europe. What is basically happening is that the, this, the strain of all this falls on the rural landlord first and the rural landlord as it is wont borrows to meet the expenses and so becomes indebted. One of the big reasons for the anti semitism that burst forth, one of the big reasons for the harassment of the Jews which burst forth during the crusades is that the rural aristocracy was getting more and more entangled into debts and who controlled the funds? The Jews. So, systematically the growth of anti-Semitism can be also connected to the poverty or the impoverishment of the rural rich due to their own conspicuous consumption and due to their participation in warlike activities such as crusades. The other side of the burden falls right at the bottom of the feudal hierarchy on the serfs. You may recall that the serf gets defined clearly 
right at the time when the Romans said the labor in the estate cannot leave the estate, they have to stay there, that is how the serf gets defined in the system. Subsequently, it gets formalized, institutionalized socially, it gets incorporated as a hierarchy, so the serf is at the bottom. As you know, the serf has a little piece of land granted to him which he can use for his survival and subsistence provided he worked for his landlord on land landlord's property, not just on landlord's property, but served the landlord in a number of ways. Over time, some of the serfs became free, were granted freedom, they were called freemen, but they were also tenants of the landlord. So, rural society became many layered, but what is important is that when the economic burden falls, it falls, it falls not just on the serf, but also on the poor farmer who is a free man in the rural areas. So, increasing rural discontent is another facet of the rural society with the advent of the crusades and after. So, that from the 14th through to the 16th century, you had peasant riots peasant movements in Europe in different parts. Eventually, the breakdown of the rural society never happened in a complete form in Europe for the simple reason that by about the 16th century, the newly growing class of urban bourgeoisie of the urban traders, the merchants, the artisans, the workmen and so forth. They developed a symbiotic relationship with the rural aristocracy. Politically, the new class of prosperous learned to coexist with the older elite of aristocracy. And such a coexistence is what you find in the British constitution today. The aristocracy formally never gave up ground in Britain, although industrialization brought enormous prosperity to the non aristocratic elite. But partly this non aristocratic elite was co opted into aristocracy by grant of aristocratic titles to leading businessmen, leading manufacturers and so forth. So, the breakdown of rural society proper never happened across Europe, but what happened was there was a gradual breakdown of feudalism as a socio political institution. So, you find the growth of cities through trade, through business, you find the decline of feudalism in rural areas. So, what is happening here is a shifting political balance. The political balance of power is shifting from the rural aristocracy to the urban well to do. Which means that if the monarch is astute, he or she will know with whom to be allied at what time and on what issue. In other words, the scope for monarchy as an independent source of power over and above the aristocrats grows with the rise of the merchant class, with the rise of the urban elite. So, from the 16th century onwards, you find all over Europe more and more alliance between the urban merchant trading 
manufacturing elite on the one hand and the king and the monarch on the other side. In this way, the decline of feudalism was expedited because as the king grew stronger, he could also put down the aristocracy into more, more orderly conduct of political life. So, the decline of feudal, feudal elite, the decline of feudalism as an institution itself led to the growth of another huge institution which characterized modernity, the rise of the nation state. The nation state comes into existence in place of a multi layered, vast and complex feudal society. By about the 17th century, by the time of the Stuarts in England, later Stuarts, certainly in the later half of the 17th century, much of the modern political structure of England had come to place. The modern nation state of England had come to stay by the end of the 17th century. It had not done so in France. In France, it happened by early 19th century. In France, the whole of the 18th century is a period of enormous gestation. Things are happening inside, nothing is visible. Finally, there is an explosion in the last two decades of 18th century in revolutionary form with the demise of monarchy of the old order and with the rise of new power in the name of the people. At that point in time, he threw up just another emperor which was Napoleon, but later it consolidated itself in the next 50 years into a more democratic social organization of France. In the Germanic states, I am saying Germanic states because Germany as we know it now did not happen till the second half of the 19th century. There are a number of principalities and kingdoms which were Germanic, Prussia, Saxony and so on and so forth, 28 or 29 such principalities were Germanic. They all became integrated. By 1850s, you had the modern Germany. But there again, when Germany gets integrated, it is integrated more in the form of modernity than in the form of feudalism. Across the Italian peninsula, once again, the aristocracy is giving way to more democratic forms of governance in the name of new nation states. So, demise of feudalism, growth of trade and commerce and the cities and the new nation state is on its way. With the coming into being of these new nation states, or rather gradual emergence of these new nation states, the church starts declining. The Roman Catholic Church starts going through its decline. There are three principal areas to think of 
when you are thinking of the decline of the church. One, in the church's running conflict with secular power, by secular we mean non-ecclesiastic power. The four great doctors whom I mentioned earlier, one of whom was Saint Ambrose. Saint Ambrose drew the lines of demarcation between the secular state and the ecclesiastic power as held by the Pope very clearly. But such lines can never be clearly drawn because politics is a matter of continuously shifting power. So when the emperor is more powerful, the Pope is more subservient. And when the Pope becomes more authoritative, then the and the emperor subserves, complies. But there is a shifting balance which happens through the period. But with the new nation states emerging, the secular power acquires certain economic might which it never had before. This economic might is something which we must talk about a little bit because the church's main confrontation with the secular power, quite aside from the fact that it represented an independent authority, which very often the kings did not like. The fact is the church was a major resource controller. It was among the largest landlords of Europe. Some of the kings did not have enough land as the church did. In addition, the monasteries, which were the other wing of the ecclesiastic power, they had immense property. So, one way or other, the eyes of European kings could not fail to notice the rising status of ecclesiastic power as growing landlords, which means they control much more resources than the kings did, as simple as that. And the crisis happens in Europe, essentially starting with England, with the Tudors, the Tudor dynasty of whom the important one with, it, with whom the struggle started was Henry the seventh. It was not Henry the seventh who was so powerful a challenge to the church as his son Henry the eighth. We do not want to go at this point in time into the details of the marriages and divorces of Henry the eighth, which led to the crisis with the Pope. The fact remains that the Pope disallowed the annulment of his first marriage. And Henry the eighth said that if you are annulling my marriage, I do not need you. So, the first breakaway church was formed, the church of England with the king as a head. The English, English monarch declared that the secular and ecclesiastic head of the church was one and vested in his person. So, this was the first way in which the crisis of power between the state and the church was breaking out. Subsequently, in the next 30 years, vast quantities of monastic and church lands were taken over by the state in modern parlance nationalized. So, after that, every time in Europe a king became powerful, he eyed the church lands covetously. I need that land. How can I get it? The second area where the church and the king or the secular and ecclesiastic power came face to face 
was with the emergence of secular institutions of learning. The European kings encouraged secular learning quite aside independently of ecclesiastic learning. If you remember, by the time the 5th century had arrived, it was more or less clearly established tradition that the church would not encourage secular learning. It would only learning encourage, it would only encourage learning as propagated by the church. So, the opening of universities, institutions of learning sponsored by the royalty across Europe meant that knowledge was becoming secular, the society was being opened out to thinking and the kings were instrumental in creating forms of thinking, growth of ideas which were not strictly favorable and friendly to the ecclesiastic power. This was the second. And the third feature as we see of this growing conflict between the church and the state is the increasing corruption in the church. There was this practice which had gone on for some centuries, whereby a king or a potentate or a prince or some secular power could have his man elected and appointed as a bishop and on payment of certain fees to Rome to the pope, the pope would conduct or the church would conduct the investiture ceremony of making officially declaring this person as a bishop. So, members of the aristocracy could become bishops and therefore, also enjoy ecclesiastic power. Now, this was done with the connivance of Rome in the sense that it amounted to the Pope and his organization selling bishoprics for money. So, this practice had gone on for quite some time till the 16th century, it came to a point of no return when the church itself had to go through a reformation, it broke under the tremendous attack of Martin Luther and his main point of attack was these investitures as they were called. These investitures which were basically a source of corruption and a source of dilution of the ecclesiastic purity of the church, these were questioned by Martin Luther, Calvin and other Protestant leaders. So, the church had three perspectives from which it could fall. It could fall due to its struggle with the king for political authority. It could fall due to its loss of control over education and development of knowledge. It could fall also due to increasing loss of credibility for its own organizational and institutional structure whatever the church went into crisis. And finally, there was a reformation of the church and as the church was reformed, newer forms of Christianity came into existence, Protestantism. Have I talked to you about the rise of Protestantism earlier? No. So, this is the time. Martin Luther. What was Martin Luther's main contention when he opposed the Roman Catholic Church? His first contention was 
Roman Catholic Church was a corrupt organization. It sold offices for money. Second, the language of the God in the Roman Catholic Church is Latin, which nobody in Europe understands. So, he started writing and printing in large quantities the Bible in German. That was also the time when Caxton had invented the printing press and vast quantities of this is the political acumen of Martin Luther, vast quantities of printing of Bibles in German was undertaken in such a short period that he tried to ensure that every German home had a German Bible. And then he started to make people rethink about Christianity and what, what Christianity means. One thing he showed clearly that all the pomp and luxury and the show and the vast number of rituals which were involved in Roman Catholic forms of worship were totally unnecessary for a good Christian. He argued that to be a good Christian was only to be a virtuous person. It did not mean going through all these pompous conspicuous consumption. Next, not only he, but all other reformists were stressing on the fact that Christianity is defined by the church as an other worldly religion. You know, I am a Christian and I might commit a thousand sins as I live and then as I die, my body is interred in a piece of land which the local church provides, so that my soul might, might await within the bounds of the religious institution, it is being summoned on the day of judgment to be judged by the Lord and Master, by God. So, eventually all Christians brought up in this faith look to their salvation after death. I die and then I, I await judgment and then I will have to either go to heaven or hell or stay in a limbo which is neither heaven nor hell. Now, this otherworldly aspect of Roman Catholic Church was dismissed by all the Protestant reformers. They said, no, religion is a relationship between you and God and it is here now. God judges you not on some day of reckoning, a day of judgment which is some where in the future, but now. You judge yourself in the eyes of God with every activity that you do today. So, the world of Christians is a world of today, not life after. So, this was a major stress laid by Protestant reformers. In other words, they gave a paradigm, a model to the Christians through which they could evaluate their own day to day conduct. Max Weber of whom you might have heard Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism says that the conversion of Christianity into a religion of day to day practice from a preoccupation with otherworldliness was so pronounced in the areas where the reform had taken place that People were looking at the virtue and vice of their living in terms of looking at and reflecting on their day to day activity. So, what happens? You have to be thrifty, you do not want to live conspicuously, 
because it is it's a sin, it is a virtue to live thriftily. So, you are thrifty, in the process you save money, you are not wasting it and the saving you invest in a business and the business grows and the growth of business is further encouraged by the fact that you are efficient not because you want to maximize profit so much, but because you say everything I do must be in the service of God. So, I must run this business efficiently, competently in the service of God, it is my calling that is the term they use the word calling. So, efficiency is encouraged by the notion of calling, thrift is encouraged by the notion of virtuous living. So, Weber says the whole spirit of capitalism was born through protestant ethics. This is a revolution in ideology. Because along with you are freeing yourself from several centuries of shackles imposed by a theological faith system. As Russell says, the mind becomes free again by the 16th century because by then your mind is free to look at other things because the repressiveness of such organized belief system is incredible. Copernicus was writing about the heliocentric astronomy whereas church insisted that the earth was the center of the universe and when Galileo went further along in this area of writing, he had to retract, he had to retract for the simple reason that the church compelled fear in, minds, in the minds of people. So, Galileo retracted and as you will see shortly, somebody like Descartes, incredible mathematician whose mathematical works lay at the very basis of Newton's physics, but Descartes was very soft when it came to his theology. He did something which some of the Greek speculative philosophers were trying to do trying to establish the existence of God by means of reason, by means of rational thought. If you recall what we did in the last class, this is the kind of thing which we found many Greek philosophers trying to do. This habit carried through in even in the times of Descartes. The reason this happened was because of the power power of ideas or power over ideas which the church had. So, with the decline of the church, human thought and human action became much, much more liberated. So, that by the 18th century, you had arriving in front of you an age which was known as the age of enlightenment. Can somebody tell me something about enlightenment? Have you studied it before? Charanya? Enlightenment has to do with, uh, um, it, it has to do with a, a few distinct 
concepts such as rationality and um, the use of uh, logic and reason rather than f uh, a faith based way of thinking. Have you heard of the encyclopedia movement in France? Have you studied enlightenment somewhere as a part of this course? Hmm, touched upon it? Have you have you heard of somebody called Rousseau? What did he say? Lovely. So he spoke of general will. Then what else did he speak of? Did he speak of something called social contract? What is that? The individual uh, gives to the society by uh, contributes to the society by keeping so society intact because it's a collection of individuals and the society in turn protects the individual from himself and from other individuals. And? From other individuals. And if a person refuses to be part of this, uh, such a thing, he is not being part of the general being. So he should be forced to be free if he is very nice. Very nice. Do you have anything to say about the state of nature? That is the nature of man before the contract. He All right. Did you have anybody talking about social contract at that time? Hobbes. Hobbes. Okay, tell me about Hobbes. So Hobbes' state of nature was a barbaric man hmm. uh, for whom unless you know there is uh, there is some sort of compulsion or some regulation on his behavior, each one is on his own like, trying to survive. Is that in the state of nature right. or is it after? This is the state of nature, and uh, after the who regulates him? In the state of nature, no. An absolute sovereign. That's not in the state that of nature. Is not the state of nature. The state of nature is an anarchy and how? Perfect, beautiful, beautiful, and anything goes. And therefore, what happens? How can you attain security in this kind of a situation? No, not code of conduct. It's a lot bigger than that. Code of conduct is more like lock. Hobbes says, give all your liberty into the hands of the Leviathan. Right? The Leviathan is the supreme authority. You hand yourself in completely into the care and protection of the Leviathan. Surrender all your freedoms into the hand of the Leviathan so that you might have security. Because Hobbes says, in a state of freedom, you have no security. In a state of freedom, you tend to destroy yourself through your acquisitiveness. So the best thing to do is to hand yourself in to the hands of a leviathan. So that is a social contract in order to give away your freedoms. So you have Rousseau talking of a social contract. Then you have Hobbes talking of a social contract. Is there anyone else who talked of social contract at that time? Locke. Okay. Can you tell me something about what Locke was saying? Okay, we will talk about Locke separately 
no problem. We'll talk about log separately, no problem. But what I was aiming at in all these discussions on social contract is that this is all part of the age of enlightenment. We are talking for the first time in human history after the Greek period of people who decided that or people who argued that the decision of people about how they live must be in their hands, not in the hands of anybody which is larger than them except for Hobbes of course. So, in Locke the social contract is formed by people to surrender part of their freedom, not all of their freedom, part of their freedom so that they might have security. And more important Locke was, Locke was very clear that if at any point of time the state into which hands these freedoms were handed over partially, at any point of time it became evident that the state is crossing its own bounds, then it was within the rights of the individual to work towards the overthrow of the state. So, the state had its authority completely determined by the boundaries of the social contract. Now, this kind of a political thinking is part of age of enlightenment. This kind of political thinking occurred only at that time or it was leading up to that time when all these articulations came up. All the politics of modernity that we see today, democracy, a welfare state, rights and privileges of the citizens, all these things came at this time. It was from Locke that you had the modern forms of government, the threefold center of authority, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary and Montesquieu, the Frenchman wrote about Locke and propounded this as a universal system which the whole world must follow. And it is stated that the American constitution is substantially influenced by Locke's ideas via the writings of Montesquieu. So, this was a period, the mind was breaking out into new political concepts. It was breaking out into individualism of an order unknown. It was a period when the French symbolized the extreme ends to which the freedom might go by simply knocking the heads of the monarchs which ruled them. So, the age of enlightenment, the 18th century is where all the developments from the crusades culminates. No? The whole thing starts with the crusades, very inadvertently, but moves very progressively and very clearly. Where does it culminate? In the age of enlightenment, where not only new science is coming to being, new philosophies are coming to being, new political ideologies are coming to being. And most important, the industrial revolution is a matter of fact, it is not speculation anymore. So, economics as we know today is a product of this time. Economics and all the universals that economics is talking about is a creature of the times when the age of enlightenment was on. So, it is this at this point that we start talking about the history of economic thought, how it comes to acquire the state of knowledge as a science and what happened just prior to that and finally, and how the science formulated itself. This is our discourse in the times to come. So, next week we shall begin by talking about mercantilism, which was one of the earliest economic ideas of modernity. It is still not a science at the time of mercantilists. 
it is still pragmatic. How to make a prosperous rich nation is the concern of the mercantilist and we shall see mercantilism and its critique next week and then move on from there to the study of physiocracy which in my opinion is the first formulation of economics as a theoretical structure. The core of most of what you know today as economics lies in the writings of physiocrats who were not writing economics in that sense. They were thinking of the economy as an organic system and how its flows can be analogous to an organic flow in an organic system. So, we will do physiocrats, mercantilism next week. Good evening. <laughs>